we are having a very interesting honor being taught, which many of you ask during the week who created it and what is it about. And uh, Pastor Andrzej is our Scottish Mission Pathfinder Director. So, um, uh, so thank you, Pastor Andrzej, for uh, taking time uh, to teach this very interesting honor. And um, we look forward. Here it is. Can you see him in the middle of all these flags? Th that man there, that is uh, uh, Pastor Andrzej. I can see that you put your uniform. And because you have the uniform, now uh, he projects the flags on your uniform as well. But that's all right. So uh, we will start in about two minutes time, uh, quickly go uh, for your break if you need it. And then after that, um, uh, we're gonna start with uh, uh, Pastor Andrzej. For everybody who is watching on Facebook Live, we thank you for staying with us there because unfortunately we do not have space in the Zoom uh, room. So uh, uh, I'm sharing the Facebook link in a Zoom room right now for everybody who would like to share with their friends. If you're on a Facebook Live, share the link on your Facebook wall as well. That will help us spread the word. We have about 100, well, we have 100 people in the Zoom room and we have 224 at the moment on Facebook Live. Uh, so to everybody who joined, a big thank you. Uh, we know that many join from different parts of the world and we wanna say you are more than welcome. And uh, we would love to have you uh, even next Sunday and Saturday. On Saturdays, we are running Adventure Awards. And uh, the next Saturday, for those who would like to take Adventure Awards for our adventurers, um, at the moment we know it is gonna be hygiene and something else, two awards. And then a week after that, let me check the list because I cannot remember these things anymore. Uh, so the next uh, Sunday for the part of final honors, uh, uh, here it is. Uh, so we are having uh, Pastor Cliff Herman, uh, very likely teaching the geocaching as one of the uh, requirement awards. We are looking to have a pizza making. So that means uh, there'll be some uh, dough and tomato sauce coming out. And amphibians by, pa uh, by Vernon, who is area coordinator for the South Indian Conference. So that's what it is. Pastor Andrzej, uh, let us uh, pray. Uh, and then I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pray this time and then Pastor Angie is gonna start the honor, which is called vexillology. So let us bow our heads and let us pray. Uh, dear God, thank you so much for time. We can be together. Uh, dear God, we pray that in this uh, difficult time, uh, you lead um, our doctors, our scientists, our governments uh, to deal with this virus the best. But we know, dear God, that there is nothing that uh, you cannot do. And we pray, dear God, if it's your will to to find a way for all of us to get out of this um, epidemic at the moment. We pray for everybody who is very sick at the moment. Dear God, uh, place your hand of healing upon them. And also we pray for those uh, who are uh, sick, but not so seriously. Dear God, help them um, uh, to fight with this virus and find a full health and recovery. We pray for every single part finder and adventurer in um, our union, uh, uh, but also all our other unions are across this world. Uh, we pray, dear God, that you keep them safe in this difficult time. And uh, we pray a special blessing on Pastor Angie and also on Nita, who just presented. Uh, we pray that you keep her safe as she goes to hospital today. And for Pastor Angie, we ask, dear God, that you can give him the words to share this beautiful honor with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Pastor Angie, uh, um, um, just once again to give official welcome and welcome to everybody uh, to this uh, e honor program uh, created uh, by uh, British Union Conference to serve our part finders and adventurers uh, in the lockdown situation. So, guys, we are so happy to have you. Uh, uh, my name is Dejan Stojkovic, I'm British Union Conference part finder and new director. And uh, we have uh, Pastor Andre, who is of a Scottish mission. And we know we have some Scots in this group, uh, a Scottish mission, uh, the part finder director. And we thank you for joining us, uh, Pastor Andre. You can start sharing your screen and uh, we can start with the honor. Come on, Scotland. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, right? I didn't know that. Unfortunately, everybody is muted uh, so that there is no uh, rebellion happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, guys. And uh, welcome saying? to the vexillology honor. Uh, vexillology sounds like a long word and um, a little complicated but we hope uh, it is clear for you so that you can understand so as uh, pastor 
Dan has already said, please keep your mics mute, muted. And uh, if you have anything to put on the chat, you'll be able to show it to us. But it's great to see all you guys participating in this uh, program of e-honors. Uh, and we pray that everything will go well today as we do the vexillology uh, honor. So let me find out from you guys. Do you have a flag in your house? Anyone has a flag in their home? Okay, guys, now you need to uh, uh, show me the flags. If you have a flag in your home, you want to quickly show me a flag you have. Uh, I can only see one. Oh, Esther Espinosa. There's a flag there. Am I missing any other flag? I can't see any other. Oh, Lauren Blake, he's got the Jamaican flag. <laughs> well done, Lauren. <laughs> and Candice. Oh, I love to see all those flags. Now, every flag has got a story behind it. And um, Vexillology tries to bring out those stories in a nice, creative way so that everybody recognizes that there's a big history. I saw yours as well, Gia. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly. And I see Austin has got his Austin dollar. Come on, Austin. Well done for that. You are giving us a good flag there. So it's lovely to see all those uh, uh, flags. But every flag has its story. Every flag has a history, something significant. Yes, Togo Zile. Yes, you've just shown the South African flag. And I know one pastor who is going to be so excited with that. So good, good. But every story has its flag. Um, or every flag has its story, sorry. And uh, we want to discover the fun stuff about some flags. And uh, we want to share those with us so that we can get to know. There's a lot of countries that are being mentioned right now. When we uh, learn about uh, the coronavirus, for example, um, and we just had that excellent honor on, the, uh, on viruses. Now, when we learn about that, they are telling us about different places in the world. So it's kind of good to know uh, some of the flags because they are very important in teaching us a little more about each and uh, every honor. So I'm going to get the PowerPoint started and then I will say a few things that would be very important for us to note, uh, especially because this honor has, wait for it, the best part of this honor is the test. Okay, so I'm sure you're all looking forward to doing the test. And so um, we need to kind of have the information and uh, you need to take notes and you need to be um, well aware of everything that is being done. I will mention the part where we really need to be uh, focusing, especially because of the test. Now, Pastor uh, Simon Sue. Uh, created this Pathfinder honor for the Southeast Asia Union uh, when he was serving uh, as the Union Youth Ministries Director. And so he created this particular honor for uh, um, that region, but it's gone to different places and it's a lovely honor uh, that um, I, would, I am so happy to be part and to be involved in teaching this honor. As you can tell, and has been said, I'm from Scotland. I'm in Scotland, but I'm originally from Zimbabwe. So you can see the Zimbabwean uh, flags there. And uh, you can give the Zimbabwean flag a wave and say, hi, Zimbabwean flag. Okay. <laughs> and then the Scottish flag. Now that's where my heart is right now, brave heart and everything. Scotland, come on, Scotland. I'm sure you are so happy to see that uh, flag. This is our honor uh, for vexillology. And as you can see, it already has different flags in there. But I need to say from the start that this is not the flag's uh, honor. You will see this, these are the requirements for the flag's honor. That one is, on, um, is a different honor altogether. Vexillology is about the cool stuff about the flags. Just the cool stuff. We just cut out all the other things and we just leave the cool stuff. 
or the most interesting facts about, about flags. That's what we look at. But there are some things from the flags honor, which I just referred to, that I would like you to know and be familiar with as we come into uh, this honor. It's the fact that there's different types of flags, and that's very important for us to know. So have a look at those different types of flags. Now, this will not be in the test, but it's something that I would like you to know ahead of time, okay? So those are the different, and then there's uh, different parts of uh, the flag that we will be referring to. For example, the field, uh, the canton. So we will refer to those things. So I, I would like you to have an idea when we do reflect, refer to them so that you can see and be familiar with it. Okay, we've got the staff, we've got the field, the canton, the hoist, um, I'm not sure, we don't refer to the ratio, but it's good for us to know. And then uh, the emblem that's placed on the field or added to the basic design of a flag, which is the charge. And then the fly, so the fly will be referred to the part of a flag that's furthest from the staff, okay? So it's good for you to, to, to know that. I, I think there's also, um, yeah, some of these things, just familiarize yourself with that screen. Uh, it's not necessary for this particular honor, but it's something from the flag uh, honor, which I referred to earlier on. Now, how did I come in to be interested in uh, flags? The Scottish referendum, which happened on Thursday, the 18th of uh, September, 2014. We in Scotland wanted to be free and independent from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, which didn't happen really. And we shall not say a lot about that because Pastor Dayan will not be very happy. So we'll quickly move on. But then um, there was a question which I saw on the BBC website. They said, what would the Union Jack look like if the Scottish feet were removed. And so I, I got interested in that and uh, started looking up this whole issue about flags and uh, Scotland. We were moving towards Christmas at that time when I took uh, much interest uh, in it. Now, the next slide will show us, this is the Union Jack. And so how is it made? This was my main part of uh, our interest. This is when I started looking at uh, St. Patrick's flag and um, St. Andrew's cross and uh, looking at St. George's. You see all these make up the Union flag, okay? Now have a look at that. So all of them, including, of course, the St. Andrew's, the saltire, and see how they all come together now to make the Union flag. So <clears throat> with all this happening, it was quite interesting for me to say, to see how, how would the, the new flag look like if Scotland uh, pulled out. So look at that Union flag. And then you realize that it is made out of the, the white saltire on the blue field that was taken from uh, St. Andrew's Cross and the salt tire from St. Patrick, uh, that's been um, also counterchanged with the white salt tire from St. Andrew. So the two of them can be seen uh, in there. And then of course the background. And so people started trying to guess what it would look like and some of them suggested this. That looks terrible. Trust me, you guys, are well, the rest of the United Kingdom needs Scotland to stay in the Union if the Union Jack has to make sense. And uh, look at the other suggestion that came about and uh, you know, look at all this. It wasn't looking nice at all. And so that's why I took an interest and I, little did I know that there was actually a vexillology honor that Simon Sue then uh, brought forward. And it was then that I met him and he came to Scotland obviously because you cannot do a vexillology honor and not come to Scotland. 
So that applies to all of you who are out there. We look forward to seeing you in Scotland very soon. Now the requirements for our honor are as follows. We've got, um, we will go through each of them, but you can just take a quick look. So Simon has put together this new basic level. Uh, we've had the vexillology honor uh, before, but it was different. And we'll be going through each of these uh, items. So they make up our honor. So let's go straight into the first one. Uh, and it is obviously what is vexillology and how is the word derived? Well, vexillology is the scientific study of flags and related emblems, uh, both modern and uh, historical. So it studies the creation of a flag design and usage as well as flag development. So that's the definition of vexillology. And we want to, in vexillology, look at the most interesting things about that development, the most interesting things about emblems and uh, organizations. So we don't want to focus much on the flags, but the cool stuff about uh, flags. The word vexillology is made up of a Latin word vexillum, which means flag, and the Greek word logia, that is study. And the vexillum was a kind of a flag or a standard with a fabric hung from a horizontal crossbar uh, on a pole. And this was used by the Romans in ancient time. So this is the history of how we get the word of vexillology. We can see there an ancient Roman uh, relic that shows a woman carrying uh, a vexillum. And um, so these are the bits that you need to be acquainting yourself with or taking notes of. All the material that we are now showing uh, is what you really need to be taking note of. That's right. Uh, just to remind everybody, as uh, Pastor Angel takes to the next slide, uh, the, we will have an uh, online test for you on the end. So uh, uh, the, the, the percentage for scoring the past is quite high. So make sure you take a good notes and also do not worry in case you miss something of this presentation, this will be recorded and posted on Facebook and YouTube later on. So, but at the moment for you to pass this test, make sure you take a good notes and the link will be shared on the end. Okay. Now, and the, that word vexillology was first used in 1957 uh, by the US scholar and vexillologist Whitney Smith. Um, he was a professor of political science at uh, Boston University. So Whitney Smith. And um, he also is responsible for that mm -hmm. flag. That is, he designed uh, the flag of uh, the, the Guyanese flag. That's him. <clears throat> okay. What function do flags serve? Now that's a good question to think about. The functions that flags serve. Now we're going to go through different functions of flags. Uh, the first flags were used to assist military coordination on battlefields. It also enabled the army to know where their commander was. So this aspect of the military coordination is a very important one uh, and shows the main history behind flags. But over time, flags have come to mean a little much more than just uh, for uh, the military. Flags are used to indicate as well whether a party or a person is a friend or foe especially in times of war. And you'll know wherever you see the Scottish flag, that means there's good people, it's the most friendly flag in the whole wide world. I see all of you smiling, because you know that's true. The Scottish flag. 
And the next point is flags were used by warriors to raise their spirit for battle. As long as the flag was flying, it meant that they had not lost the battle. As long as the flag was flying, they had not lost the battle. And I think that's a very important point, especially as we will come to uh, the parts that show flags and the Bible. That uh, is a very important point. Flags are used to symbolize and identify countries and organizations and events and uh, allegiances. So they, as you can see at the Olympics, you will see and identify the countries through their flags. We see the Indian flag there and the Canadian flag. Okay, flags were flown, when flown at half mast, I used to also express national uh, mourning upon the death of the ruler, the prime minister or the president, uh, the ruler of the state, or someone significant um, in a state. So flags have been flown at half mast to express national uh, mourning. The next point is the raising of flags are used to celebrate a victory of an achievement. I'm sure you're familiar with that, back to the Olympics and other games as well, um, where flags play a very important role. The white flag is an internationally recognized protective sign to indicate a call for truce or ceasefire uh, or request to negotiate or to surrender. And so there's special rules, for example, under the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, a person carrying or waving a white flag signifies that the approaching negotiator is unarmed. So they are pleading uh, for surrender and you cannot fire somebody, uh, you cannot shoot someone who's waving a white flag. Okay, the black flag is used to express protest, opposition, or defiance. So when people are not happy, uh, they may get together. And uh, when they have the black flag, that shows that um, they are not happy. They are protesting against something. Right, so that's another point of uh, the usage of flags. And on a similar note, the burning and desecration of a flag uh, sometimes is used to indicate displeasure and anger. And this is not something that, uh, it's something that we should not condone. It's something that we do not uh, encourage people to be doing. Okay, next point. So you need to kind of catch up with um, notes, especially because we have a test. So, do bear that in mind when you're taking notes. Take good notes. Red flags are used to warn others of danger, especially on a beach. I'm sure you've seen at some point such a flag to show, show you that beyond this point uh, lies uh, some danger. So whenever we see this, we want to be very careful, especially as pathfinders. When we see a red flag, it calls for caution. Flags can be used to communicate messages. So we have the Semaphore International Code of Signals that basically uses flags uh, between ships. So that's a very important aspect uh, for the nautical expressions out at sea. Okay. Next one is the flags are used to proclaim a possession or power over the people and a uh, land uh, so sovereignty to show that we own this place. So whenever we want to say that in a different way from saying many words, we can say it through a flag. Just put up the flag and we show that we own this place or we were the first people to this place. And I'm sure as I say that, 
many of you would think of uh, the first person to the moon and uh, the flags that were put there. We will not mention any names because they were not Scottish. Okay, the next point is what's the difference between um, an enzyme and an onomast? Enzyme, onomast. An enzyme is a flag used at sea and it's placed uh, at the stern or at the back of a boat or ship to indicate um, its nationality. So we see an example there of the Malaysian enzyme. Okay, and uh, an onomast on the other hand is a flag or a pennant showing the name of a ship or a shipping company. And uh, it doesn't necessarily show the nationality. Okay, so we have examples there of uh, onomasts. Onomasts are, okay, so now and again, I get this guy coming up. So just to let you know, uh, uh, Pastor Andre, we are now uh, approximately about halfway to the presentation. Uh, you, you know, how many slides are there so that just gives you uh, some time uh, time um, orientation but certainly thank you so much there was a uh, many uh, many positive comments on facebook and many agreeing with what you're saying so thank you and uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a also beautiful comments here as well in the zoom room thank you so much for what you're doing thank you okay so those are the notes on uh, onomas, uh, white streamers, but often blue or red fields, yellow and green fields have been spotted as well. And the lettering may be in different fonts and scripts. And um, in many British, Russian and Danish onomas, the national flag is incorporated into the content. So if you remember the first screen I showed you or among the first screens, which showed you the parts of a flag. So you saw the canton, the top left corner. Okay, and uh, Canton itself, by the way, represents a part um, of a nation or uh, a subdivision of a country. Okay, for political or administrative purposes, you can uh, subdivide. Okay, let's go on. Such flags are declining in usage, those are the onomas, etc. And um, they first emerged in the 19th century and reached the height um, of their usage in the late part of the, the century. The usage has been recorded in numerous uh, paintings, photographs, and models, and a few flags may, may have survived. Okay, we've been told that time is. Um, Ticking, so we just need to move on swiftly. What's meant by a war flag? A war flag is also known as a military flag or a battle flag. It's different from the national flag and it's, it is for use by the nation's military forces uh, on land. So we see there the flag of Brunei, but the war flag of Brunei is slightly different. It has that red bit uh, in between. And which one of the names of God? So this is the part that I love most of this um, uh, honor. Which one of the names of God in the Bible is associated with flags? So we know the different names of God, Jehovah Jireh, uh, which we find in Genesis 22 that was said by Abraham. Uh, but there's um, another name of God that some of you may be shouting out there. You may want to say to someone next to you, if you know it. Okay, and we're going to get it here. Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord, our banner. So that's one of the names of God in the Old Testament, the Lord, our banner. So banners in the Bible say, serve really three main purposes, um, to identify a group and to claim possession of a land or a territory, as well as just for celebration. So you'll find the banners in the Bible are used to motivate people. Uh, it's like a rallying point, um, whether physical or emotional, bringing people together. 
uh, the, that purpose is well served by a banner. And in Exodus 17, verse 15, there's about just less than a dozen verses in the Bible uh, that refer to the banner, which uh, is uh, the flag as well. Another word that can be used for a flag, at least in this case. So Moses built an altar um, after the battle with the Amalekites, and uh, he had received all the help, if you, if you remember. So he had received all the help uh, to keep his hands uh, in the air so that uh, they could overcome in the battle. And after that, he wanted to, he built an altar and he called the altar, the Lord is my banner. And uh, he was saying they have dared to raise their fist against the Lord's throne. So now the Lord will be at war with Amalek after each generation. Okay, so we find that in um, Exodus 17, verses 5. Other places you will find different references, at, at least in the Psalms, uh, it's God who sets up the banner. So we'll find that in Psalm 60, verse 4, uh, Psalm 20, verse 5. Uh, there's references to banners in Isaiah as well. And uh, I like the one in Jeremiah, though, where it says in Jeremiah 50, verse 2, Declare among the nations, proclaim and set up a standard. Proclaim, do not conceal it. Say, Babylon is taken. Baal is shamed and Maradoth is broken in pieces. Her idols are humiliated, her images are broken in pieces. So that shows the victory over uh, Babylon. And we know now for the spiritual Babylon, we want to overcome. We want uh, to overcome spiritual Babylon and all the uh, false practices that are in it. And so this is encouraging because the verse associated uh, with that in Jeremiah 50 verse two uh, tells us to uh, set up the standard and to raise the banner because of the victory that was going to come over Babylon. Okay. So there you go, the Lord is my banner. That's back to Exodus 17, 15. How is the banner or flag of God described in the Bible? It's, you know the song, some of you may remember the song. He brought me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. Yeah, I hope the voice doesn't uh, uh, put you off there. So Songs of Solomon 2, verse 4, and uh, his banner over me is love. So the question, the question there was, how is the banner or flag of God described in the Bible? His banner over me is love. And I'm sure that's the banner God is flying on top of our homes in this time of uh, isolation. But we also have a Christian flag, and the person who designed it was Charles C. Overton and Ralph Diffendorfer uh, to represent all the Christianity, all of Christianity and Christendom. So those two women uh, designed it. Okay. The Christian flag has a white field with the red uh, Latin cross inside a blue canton. And the shade of red that symbolizes the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary. And the blue represents the waters of baptism as well as the faithfulness of Jesus. And as we have said, the white flag shows surrender. And that's the spirit uh, that Christ, um, even though being uh, equal with God, he did not fight for that, but uh, he humbled himself. And uh, he surrendered on the cross and he allowed that people would uh, put him to death for victory for you and me, which is an important part that flies the banner over us of love. Okay. Why was the world flag created and who designed it? So earlier on, if you logged on earlier on, you'd have seen the world flag behind me. Uh, but when I put on my uniform, it was competing with the world flag at the back. So I have to remove that uh, background screen on my Zoom. Um, 
The 80s, that's the world flag. And it was created in 1988 by Paul Carroll uh, to raise awareness and funding for nonprofit organizations working in the areas of education, world health, human rights, and the environment. So it's a unifying symbol for all the people in the world to show that we may be diverse, but uh, we, are, we can be united. And you'll see that there's some, uh, may seem like just different flags just put together. No, but there's some thought that's gone into it. In the center is the world map, uh, surrounded by 216 flags, including the United Nations flag. And the four corners of the earth are represented by those countries, uh, Sweden, Nepal, Tuvalu, and uh, Malaysia. So each country is in a relative opposite uh, location of uh, the earth from the other. Okay, what's the correct method to fly a flag at half mast during a uh, time of national mourning? Well, to fly a flag at half mast, or half staff, as it's sometimes called, is to show national uh, mourning. And this is done by first hoisting the flag all the way to the top and then lowering it um, to the halfway point. And similarly, before it is lowered, it's all raised right to the full height and then it is uh, lowered. Which country made it a law to fly her flag at half mast on Good Friday? Anybody know? Say it out to someone with you and... Um, Poland. You're correct. Make sure you write it down because I have a feeling that might come in a, in, in a test. Never know. You, you never know. know. So <clears throat> the answer is on a Good Friday, the nation flies uh, uh, flag half mast. It's Poland, is that right? <laughs> Poland, did you say? Yes, that's right. Is that right? No, it's a Greek flag. Are you saying Greek flag is like a, 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 a fly half mast? Well, it has a law on flying. So it, the question is, made it a law to fly her flag at half mast uh, on Good Friday? Thank you. Okay. And um, Good Friday week. So yeah, those in Greece will be able to observe this. Which two national flags are never flown at half mast and why is this so? Well, Saudi Arabia and Somaliland uh, forbid their flags to be flown at half mast because both flags have the uh, Shahada written on them. Uh, there is no other God except God. That's the Arabic inscription. And it's considered un-Islamic and an act of blasphemy if the flag is uh, flown at half mast. Okay, so something for you to note. Okay. And why are there two different flags flying on different occasions at Buckingham Palace? Okay, so there's a bit of history there. Until 1997, <coughs> the Royal Standard of the United Kingdom, that's uh, the flag of the British monarch, it, it was the only flag to fly from Buckingham Palace. It would only fly when the king or queen was in residence at the palace, otherwise no flag uh, would fly in the place. So unlike the Union flag, that's the national flag, the Royal, the Royal Standard is never ever flown at half mast. And this is because there is always a living monarch since the throne passes immediately uh, to the successor upon the death of the king or the queen. So it has to be like a seamless uh, process. But in 1997, there was uh, outcry in Buckingham Palace um, that the flag was not flying at half mast to grieve our princess uh, Diana's death. And so he, the queen responded. Uh, Diana was very popular and um, the queen responded by ordering a break with protocol and she replaced the royal standard with the union flag at half mast as soon as she left the palace to attend the princess funeral at Westminster Abbey. So when she came back, then the Royal Standard was again uh, fully hoisted. Okay. Okay. Today, the Union flag flies at half-mast upon the deaths of members of the royal family 
or the death of a former prime minister. So that all started with uh, Diana. Uh, Pastor Angie, just to let you know, we, are, we have probably about um, another maybe uh, 10 minutes just to let you know, uh, see uh, what we can do. Uh, maybe, oh. maybe 15, depending. <laughs> yeah, I think 15 sounds better. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. When is the only time when it's all right to fly a national flag upside down? Well, during times of emergencies or extreme danger or distress, the national flag can be flown upside down to indicate a cry for help. Okay, and which flag may be legally flown upside down when the country is uh, at a state of war? Okay, that's the Philippines uh, national flag. It's legally, it's legally unique because it is the only flag which may be hoisted upside down when the Congress of the Philippines has declared the state of war. This means the flag is flown with the red strip. So at the moment, as you see, the red strip is at the bottom, but it can be the red strip uh, on top rather than the usual blue. Okay, which national flag uh, is used to be used to be the plainest flag with only one color? Which one, which national flag only had one color? The flag of Libya. Okay, <clears throat> and um, it was chosen by the Libyan leader uh, Gaddafi to symbolize his political philosophy after the Green Book. Okay, and um, there was no design or other details. Now, this flag was replaced by the new one in 2011 after the overthrow of uh, Gaddafi. That's the new flag. Which national flag is the only flag in the world that is not four-sided? I'm sure you're screaming out the answer where you are, if you know it. Here we have it, the flag of Nepal. It's the world's only non-quadrilateral flag. And the flag is a combination of two single uh, pennons, the vexillological word for pennant. So in vexillology, we use pennons. Okay. What is so unique about the flag of Switzerland, as well as the flag of the Vatican, Think about it, if you know those flags, and boom, the answer. Well, the flag of Switzerland and the Vatican are the only country flags in the world that are, are square in shape. Well, they may not look quite square in the picture there, but those are the two country flags that are square in shape. That's unique. What's the connection between the flag of Switzerland and the Red Cross symbol? This is an interesting one as well. The design of the Red Cross symbol was based on the Swiss flag uh, by reversing the colors of that flag. So this was done in order to honor the Switzerland where the first Geneva Convention was held in 1864. And the famous Red Cross symbol, which is the Red Cross on a white background, was the protection symbol declared at that first uh, convention. Okay, you seem to be taking notes. You're doing very well. Remember, there's a test uh, for this particular honor, so you do well to take notes. Which is the only national flag that depicts human beings as a major element in its design? where you can actually see a picture of human beings, uh, the Belize flag. So it has the national coat of arms held by uh, Mestizo and a man of African descent. It is the only country to have humans depicted as a major design. On there are other flags that have humans, but not as a major element. Uh, so Malta, Montserrat, British Virgin Islands and the French uh, Polynesia. And there is the flag of British Virgin Islands. Okay, Malta, Montserrat, and uh, the flag of the French Polynesia. All right, 
Pastor Angie, we have about seven, eight minutes. Um, and uh, uh, and to give some opportunity to for some questions as well. But certainly, if you need a little bit more, that's fine. But if possible, let us maybe go a little bit faster through the slides. Uh, everybody will have the PowerPoint available to them, so that nothing to worry. You just have to uh, go on our link, and we posted the link on a Facebook as well on a Zoom room. So, Pastor Angie, you take it on from here. Okay. Which national flag has a modern weapon as part of its uh, design? And the answer is the Mozambique flag. It's the only national flag in the world to feature AK-47. That, um, hmm, yeah, that um, weapon, not very nice. It was used in the Zimbabwean uh, liberation struggle when Zimbabwe was fighting for um, freedom. And so it's not a very nice weapon when I see it because I grew up in that time. Now the rifle in the flag, uh, the Mozambican flag, the rifle stands for defense and vigilance. Um, and it was made in 1947. Um, okay, so let's move to the next one. Which two national flags have uh, the map of the country on it, on the actual flag with the map? Okay, the, that would be the flag of Cyprus and the flag of uh, Kosovo. Now you may uh, know that um, there's um, some people do not recognize, even the United Nations, uh, not recognize uh, Kosovo. And so take it as, um, take it as a pinch of salt kind of thing. Okay, Cyprus flag features a map of the uh, entirety of the island with the two olive branches and um, we have the blue background of uh, the, the Kosovo flag and the stars are officially meant to symbolize Kosovo's six major ethnic groups. And that's where some of the trouble with the flag is anyway. So we'll quickly move to the next point. Why is there a hole in the Hungarian flag in the capital city of Budapest? So as I told you in vexillology, we try and focus on the cool stuff and look at uh, the stories behind each flag. And you can see an example there. And uh, this Hungarian flag in Budapest has a hole in it because during the anti-Soviet uprising in October, uh, the revolutionaries cut out the communist emblem and then they use the flag with the hole in the middle as the symbol of the revolution. Okay, so they tore out the coat of arms that symbolized the power of the Soviet and communism. So um, making it something very important for them and their experience, their story is right in the flag. So when they see the flag, they see more than just colors. And that's what you and me can do when we think of uh, uh, the I name Jehovah Nisi. When we think of Jehovah Nisi, we think of uh, the victory that Jesus has over uh, Satan, okay? The official flag of Hungary today, that's it from 1957. What are the names of the three crosses um, found on the flag of uh, Great Britain? Okay, we referred to these earlier on when I was showing you how they all merge to come together uh, to be uh, the Union flag. So St. George's Cross, uh, St. Andrew's Cross, and St. Patrick's uh, Cross as well. I probably said St. Patrick's flag earlier on, sorry for that. Okay. Okay, so we have the blue background, white cross, St. Andrew's, and um, the white background, red cross of St. George, and then the white background, uh, red cross of St. Patrick of our island. So that's for us here in the United Kingdom, which is a flag for the British Union Conference. Okay, what's the name of the cross found on the flags of, of Scandinavian countries? It's known as the Scandinavian cross or the Nordic cross. Such a flag has a cross that is off center where the vertical bar is uh, closing to the uh, hoist side. So if you saw the parts of a flag we showed earlier on, 
uh, it's more towards the hoist side. So it's like a cross, but uh, that is uh, on its uh, side towards the hoist. According to the da a, a Danish legend, I just, you know, um, Simon includes this so well, that the Danish flag, also called the uh, Danebrog, I hope I pronounced that right, it fell from the sky in, on the 15th of June. Remember, this is a legend, okay? Uh, 1219. Uh, to the Danish king, uh, Valdemar II, who on that day defeated Estonia. I have a good friend in Estonia who will not be happy to hear this. Uh, for this reason, the Danish flag is said to be the oldest national flag in the world. And all the flags of the Scandinavian countries are then patterned after this uh, flag. Okay. Make a poster that shows the flags of 20 different countries. That's a... This is a requirement as well. So this is something we'll be asking you to do, to make such a poster which shows uh, those countries. And um, from that poster together with the test, so you, you can choose 20 different countries, that's your choice. Um, and when you make such a poster, you then submit it together with the test and that will make your vexillology honor. Of course, you're going to get more than 21 out of um, the 28 questions we have in the test. And uh, this um, is the conclusion of our vexillology honor.